like to make a few announcements. Welcome back, everyone, to the last uh, day of the oral, uh, oral communication. Uh, Joel isn't here yet because he is trying to move into that other state, which is the state of touch and music. Uh, but he will come as soon as possible, and he will try to be here when he is here. Um, there are some changes in the program. Uh, we would like to uh, make a short break of, of about 20 minutes at noon and uh, organize the, the last session at uh, like 12, 20, 12, 30 and till about 2 o'clock. And I hope that is not causing uh, problems for you when uh, lunch arrangement, but the lunch will be later at 2 o'clock. Uh, the last session will be a special session in where, where uh, Sally, Joel, and I will come, or we, we are trying to come up with questions. It might be also a statement, but we are still trying to come up with questions, and, uh, and we'd like answers. <laughs> <laughs> now, this has happened before, <laughs> but... Uh, We'll see what comes out of that. We haven't seen each other's questions yet. We want to ah, I was just excusing you. <laughs> so, um, then at uh, about 4.30, as you're invited back here for the opening of the exhibition, with the speeches that might be uh, contain complete new material for you, but there will also be other people coming in. And uh, so it's uh, just a short little uh, ceremony, and after that there will be a tour through the exhibition. And then uh, tonight uh, there will be the first uh, concert. And, uh, as you know, there will be two more days of concerts, and Saturday it will be. Uh, some of us will be more available after we've done our concerts, and uh, you're welcome to contact uh, us personally and for questions about staying in the future. But we will talk about the future at the end of the session between 12.30 and uh, 2. Well, it's a great pleasure and honor to uh, introduce Trevor. <coughs> Trevor, um, uh, we were sometimes even speaking, he is the only real composer amongst us, which is something to be taken not too seriously, but he is a serious man. Uh, <laughs> with the remarks he made, uh, it would be easy to think that he is the bodiless person <laughs> uh, I, I don't know him that way. <laughs> and he definitely, in the uh, uh, electroacoustic scene, is not the most bodiless person, for sure. Oh, he knew himself away. He said he was into being bodiless. He <laughs> 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 will be able to respond to this notion. <laughs> Trevor, may we invite you... Uh, Welcome. Thank you very much. I haven't done anything yet. Um, I, I was slightly puzzled when I was invited to this convention because I thought, what, what the hell have I got to say about touch? So I've been listening to what people have been saying, taking it in, and I'm more or less made of what I'm going to say last night. Uh, and I thought it might be <coughs> nice to begin with some actual touching, some physical touching. Um, first of all, let me say uh, that, that I, I have quite a range of activities as a musician. Um, at one extreme, I take recorded sounds, write computer programs, dissect them, transform them, and make pieces that exist on tape. Um, um, probably you think about the farthest you can get from concepts of touch. And on the other end, for economic reasons, <coughs> being a freelance composer in Britain is not an easy life. <laughs> and about the only way you can earn money in Britain is to do some kind of social good with your art. So if you go out and educate people about art, or you run community workshops about art, you can get paid. But if you want to do art, forget it. <laughs> so, in fact, I'm, I'm very much in favour, uh, I wasn't mistaken really about this, I'm very much in favour of taking the arts out to people and trying to get in contact with new audiences, particularly with young people who, don't have, who haven't built up all those prejudices about what is... Uh, what, what is music and what isn't music, or what is art and what isn't art. Uh, and I developed various workshop techniques uh, for teaching musical skills and for working with people in general. And I thought it would be nice to begin 
with a couple of these little workshop things because they illustrate some conceptions of touch. So I want to start with physical touch. And what I'd like to do is to volunteer uh, this block of people to come up to the front here and stand up. <laughs> <laughs> Games for teaching musical skills. In fact, these are best sellers in Japan. So the reason I get invited to Japan is not to do like easy music, but to play games. And this is a very simple game that uh, uh, is a, it's a variation of a game that exists in virtually all cultures around the world. Uh, so I'd like uh, the front part of you to stand in a circle close together <coughs> and then turn around, play sounds. I'll push you a little bit further that way, sorry. Um, I'd like the other five of you to stand on the outside facing those people. Just, yeah, just choose someone and face them. Right? We don't have enough. Oh, we got one. Okay. Raise both hands. Okay. Now, the people on the outside, I'd like you to move along by one hand to your right. So, like so. <coughs> Okay, excellent. Now, with this arrangement, you'll find that your left hand is touching the left hand of the person opposite you, and your right hand, the right hand of the person opposite you. And we now play a version of a game which in England is called Patty Cake. This is, this is known in Japan. It's known... Uh, it, I, I have never been anywhere where people don't know this game. Okay, and you can do this with any kind. We'll, we'll do something... Not entirely simple, but fairly simple. So this will be both. Hit both hands together. Okay? Knees. <laughs> Left. <laughs> right. <laughs> together. Okay. So that's very slow again. Both. Knees. Left. Too difficult to say. So if you find 
the phenomenology of touch, a difficult thing to say, you can use the divisibility of time for this exercise, which only you would find better. But, <laughs> um, what I'd like is, being on this side, and to repeat this fact, the phenomenology of touch, the phenomenology of touch, the phenomenology of touch, the phenomenology of touch. The phenomenology of touch. <laughs> okay. On this side, I'd like you to repeat this fact. The phenomenology of touch, the phenomenology of touch, the phenomenology of touch, the phenomenology of touch. Okay, and of course the trick is now to do it together. So I'll set you going, and you need to be loud because when they come in, they get to put you off, and then I'll introduce them. You just keep going. So. The phenomenology of touch. 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 Of the 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 of
meetings or situations or in, intentions to communicate or intentions not to communicate or whatever uh, when I do them, even when I do these things in a fairly abstract context. So what I'll do next is I'll do a little bit of verbal improvisation, uh, which I, when I play with my voice, I can train myself to separate all these things out from each other. Uh, we'll see if this kind of touching works. <coughs> this kind of solo touching. <laughs>
But if someone sings a multi-comic, everybody in the audience is interested. They're intrigued. They want to know what's happening. They may be worried. Um, <laughs> so uh, this is the next way of checking things. Now, the um, <coughs> third way, the, sorry, one, two, three, fourth way of touching things is to touch the materials. Now, obviously, when we're performing, uh, particularly with a voice, we're touching the materials in this very direct way, where we don't even have this sense of separation. It's not an arm's length thing to touch. It's <coughs> an intimate that we don't, we're not aware of that touching. But it's possible to put the voice at arm's length and to touch it um, in a special way with technology. So the next area I like to work in is to record my voice and then take it apart. If you like, put it on, on the operating table of the computer. <coughs> and I write programs that allow me to chop the voice about and do things which you cannot do in live performance. Uh, it's two, two simple examples. Um, if you take the sound... Or... Now, uh, I think... Well, I've just done that. I take the sound... Where I've got a rising thing and it's... And it's, and it's, and it's Divided into grains. And I can do that backwards. But what happens if I wanted to go at that speed? Well, it's physiologically possible. I can't actually move the pictures as fast as I can make the sound. But on the computer, I can do that. I can say to the computer, look for those grains, separate them out, each little one, and then we organize them at random, or whatever. So I can make the voice do these impossible things. In fact, there are various levels at which the computer can reorganize material. One of them is the level at which we might articulate things as events. So what, I'd say, let's imagine a, a drummer, it's easier to demonstrate <laughs> hitting things and therefore triggering sounds. We can reorganize things at that level. That tends to be what happens, say, with MIDI-based uh, triggering systems. Then uh, we can reorganize things at the grain level, which is this. You can hear the individual things, but they're so short that they're not rhythmic. Uh, you can tell whether they're faster or slower, whether they're regular or irregular. In fact, you can tell whether they're utterly regular or almost utterly regular. This is almost utterly regular, but if it were regular, you'd notice. Um, with the computer, I can reorganize things at that level. But the interesting thing also is there's a level below that. The difference between R and S ultimately is to do with what happens to the sound in time, in a very short time frame. It's something which we can't access directly, uh, physically with, with our bodies, but we can certainly access the computer. So I can turn one sound into another. I can turn my voice into the sound of a bell or anything I like. And, uh, so I, I enjoy this. And it, it's, it's interesting that uh, uh, a musician can become like a sculptor. We, we uh, talked to earlier about the idea of the uh, sculptor having this kind of relationship with the material where you have an idea to realize that then there's a resistance of the material. One has the same thing here. Um, the, the, although there are general principles about taking sounds apart and reconstructing them, until you get the particular sound you've recorded, you don't know what will happen. And often I'll pursue some strategy with my software, and, which I think, oh, this would be great. It worked last time, and it's really boring. And some other thing happens by accident. Uh, and, and it's fantastic, and I, and I use it. So there's always an interplay between the, if you like, the material of the voice, which has become physical, because we can now record it. It's like having, having actual sound there, like an object. And to illustrate this, um, first of all, I'd like to play a tiny fragment of sound. This is from the, um, the piece, Tongues of Fire. And it begins with this tiny fragment of sound, uh, which lasts about one second. And I'm then like a 25 minute piece out of this fragment of sound. Can we just hear the fragment of sound? I'll tell you when to stop it. That's on the CD. <laughs> That's it. Here it is again. <laughs> okay, stop. Uh, so, in a few wind that up. Okay, so this entire 25 minutes is made from that vocal gesture. And so, Using the, the computer, it's possible to take such an element and reconstruct it and shape it and bend it and transform it into completely different materials. Um, and I like that, that idea of transformation. That's a, that's a, a, con, a continuation of something that's very traditional in music, which is taking materials and transforming them. Now with the computer, we can actually take sound as material. 
and probably while that's widely thought, give me a, a big talk. So if you want to know about this, then you can read the book. Uh, being as I'm having to wipe the tape over. But uh, I finally wrote down in my the new book, Audible Design, all the, well, not all, uh, many of the ways that one can approach transforming sound, this, the sort of uh, things that you have to take into account. For example, this business about the time frame. Is it the time frame of events? Is it the time frame of grains? Is it the time frame of, of sonority itself? Or is it the time frame of form? You know, uh, uh, <coughs> if, if we have two events that last a minute, we can probably say with some certainty that they're roughly the same length, but we certainly can't say they're exactly the same length or nowhere near. Uh, if we have two events lasting a second, particularly if we have four events each lasting a second, we can say with a fair degree of accuracy that these are like 95% equal uh, because we have some kind of physiological measure, uh, I guess, uh, and now I'm speculating, uh, but something to do with our biological clocks or the fact that uh, we have certain bodily processes which run on these roads allow us to measure these things. We don't have to go there and go, ah, we, we know it's, yeah, that's regular. Mm. <coughs> that, that's not regular, and I don't have to be able to count it to tell that. Um, at the level of grain, well, we, we know it's, uh, the second one is faster than the first one, but we'd like to say how much faster, because it's not it's outside that range of physiologically uh, relating. Um, and down at the level of tss and pop, there's no way we can relate those, those things together. They just sound different, they have this different quality. Okay, so I'm, I'm just going to play an arbitrary bit from this piece. It's difficult to select anything in particular. But this is the sort of things you can do if you actually get hold and inside the materials, uh, all made from the little bit we've heard. <laughs> Berlin. 
Um, I decided to work on the voices of various political or well-known figures uh, and transform them in various ways. Um, the principal protagonists in this piece are uh, Margaret Thatcher, bless her soul, and <laughs> Princess Diana, bless her soul. And um, there are four pieces. Uh, two of them use Diana's voice. One of them uses Margaret Thatcher's voice. Uh, one of them uses the voice of Ian Paisley. Uh, not who Ian Paisley is. Well, you're lucky. But he's <laughs> <laughs> you're a very powerful uh, sort of evangelist preacher, uh, uh, extreme Protestant who uh, protests in the European Parliament about the existence of Catholicism. Uh, <laughs> uh, he's very vocal in opposing the unification of Ireland. Um, um, uh, but in this particular speech, you may be more sympathetic to him because he's actually sending Margaret Thatcher to the devil. <laughs> so it's not the devil sending the devil to the devil is quite an interesting idea. Uh, so what I've done here is I've, I've taken the speech and I've used various ways to modify the voice, uh, not, not very much, uh, to comment upon it. But this is what I call touching up. The problem with touching up does do belong to Andre in English. To touch up a painting is to kind of improve something that's that's, uh, say, damaged, but he also has rather unpleasant sexual connotations as well. And that's not what I intend here. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to um, bring out the, the quality of thought, if any, behind this kind of uh, <laughs> speaking, um, by the way I've treated it. Uh, there, there's some obvious things, like the use, use of cartoon line voices by, by shifting the picture. But almost more subtle things like certain words would be stretched or uh, impossible kinds of vibrato would be added to them, which are not possible to, to produce vocally. It seems to me, well, you may, you may disagree, but my feeling is I'm trying to enhance the over the topness of this kind of performance. So this is the debt. Oh, God! Thank you. 
point to the digital sound itself. There's something kind of very strange which is when you start using picture, that no matter what the sound source is, it, it acquires this kind of quality. And if you pitch it quite severely, you, you can almost hear the kind of the brain of the, of the digits. It's, it, and I wonder if anybody's ever actually, uh, this is more like a, a question for, for everybody here, has anybody actually addressed this, this? I think it's actually a problem. Yeah, but well, because it's a reductive problem. Right? There are about five, five different ways of time, time speed shifting and time stretching. They, they, they all tend to have a certain quality. But yeah, that's um, they have um, a sound. Yeah. Um, I, I guess it's uh, uh, theoretically possible, it's possible to do without there being any uh, change. You, you could build a model, if you like, and analyze the thing, build a, a, a computer, a physical model, right. the thing, and then resynthesize it. Uh, but it's very difficult to get to turn exactly the same. Uh, that, that, for myself, that doesn't worry me too much because I'm interested in the result. I'm only interested in the result. I'm not, I'm not interested in the idea that it's meant to be the original longer. I'm interested in what it actually sounds like. Yeah. And I'll choose a different t- uh, sort of pitch shifting or time stretching uh, technique depending on what and the result I want. There's some very peculiar <coughs> time stretching things in this piece which give crazy artifacts which no physicist or, or professional technical person would dream of ever using. But I'm interested in the artifacts. <laughs> and there's these crazy sounds that you get out of it. Interesting. Yes. Are there any historical documents on the uh, intention in the development of the sound, for instance, which appears in your voice there? No. At the point in which these were being uh, evolving or developing, were things written down of the intention of the, or whether things succeeded or not? I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I do my research by listening, and uh, yeah. I, I sort of go to sources like sort of know or go to things, uh, and I listen and I try to figure out physically how to make those sounds. Mm-hmm. Uh, but also the, the, the ethos in which the sounds are made as well. I'm having it in very slow context. So I tend to use them as very fast and changing. So that takes them out of context. Um, but they, they probably are. I'm, I'm very much sure. I'm like an engineer. I mean, how do you do these things? Yeah, no, as far as the 15th century Japanese, uh, if you would. Ah, oh, I doubt it. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs>
And um, so I want to like, don't find a way to use natural sound, but be able to use it in a completely different way. So that I was trying to achieve something that was mm -hmm. I wanted to have more complexity than you were familiar to some extent. So it's, it's a strange thing. It's like it, it's it's not this my, own person. Not my, my link is, is really to the idea of transformation for various reasons. I'm interested in the idea of transformation. And what I like about the voice is you can make these transformations from what kind of uh, very easily. Uh, and the computer is the only other instrument, well, not the only, but the only other powerful, really powerful instrument that can do that. Uh, and I, I'm interested in the idea of change and mutability. It's a kind of like aesthetic or even a political uh, reason for being interested in this. Uh, and that's the other link. You were talking about touching your own voice. Uh, what's for you the difference working with your own voice in the piece or working with these other uh, people? Okay, well, there, there's actually three things. There's working with your own voice, uh, working with other people's voices by telling them what to do, uh, or, or giving them instructions or what to school, and working with someone else's voice by just recording it. So I, I would only tend to, uh, uh, what, what, why I want to manipulate someone's voice directly on tape, I'd either ask them, or there had to be some good political reasons to do it, because it's a bit, bit of an unfriendly thing to do. Um, when you're working with performance, it, uh, it, there's an interesting set of constraints, because when I'm, when I'm actually performing myself, things happen, either in terms of how fast they happen, or even in terms of energy. I remember once improvising with a saxophonist, and I was producing these sounds so much louder than the saxophonist. Uh, and not that I can't hear it at all. Um, but this was about a microphone. Um, but I, I couldn't do that again afterwards. Uh, so as things happen out of the energy of the performance that you can't predict. But when you have performance, you have to be able to say, I want to make this sound there. Well, not necessarily. Let's say it's a piece of story in which events follow each other, and you have to do this there. Uh, I can go, ah, 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 but I can't say, okay, I want you to do that at 35 seconds after sitting your well in flat or something. It just, uh, it, it, uh, you can ask, it's uncard, it's A, uncard, B, it's probably impossible. So there's a different, there's something different goes on. I mean, in general, a very simple thing is improvised music can tend to be more fast and more articulate than composed music because you can articulate things directly, very quickly, and very uh, subtly. But you, you can't ask people to articulate that, so you can't, not, not you. Uh, so so there's, there tends to be a set of things you can do, and a set of things you can do together when you give a score to people, uh, which is, is smaller than the set of things you can actually do when you do yourself. I was, uh, you were speaking about the operation room or operate the table, oh, where okay. you dissect or okay. reconstruct uh, the body <laughs> the sample. Uh, I can imagine that with basically different vibe uh, <laughs> with your own voice. Is, is there, I mean, the kind of uh, uh, emotional relationship <laughs> Can you treat your own voice as a political voice? Uh, no, that's, that's interesting what you say. No, I tend to treat my own voice just as source. That's something that I know it's, to other people it's me. Uh, to me, it, it's just a source of sonority. Um, when I'm working with it in that way, when I'm working you know, with what's it Daisy or Princess Diana or whatever, I'm, I'm aware of their personality, their public, their public personality, and therefore I'm trying to interact with that in some way, to, to, to draw it out or comment on it. Uh, I, I need I need to work in that way, but in, in another sense it would be pointless to use their voice in particular, unless I'm going to do that. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, uh, sometimes tend to uh, have voices of people that I really like somewhere stored in my memory and that during a piece when you know things go wrong or something I can call them up to share <laughs> yeah. is, is this an enemy <laughs> 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 I don't know most of people already don't but I can't <laughs> imagine that your, your own voice can just be treated as source yes yeah. uh, yeah. yeah. I have a uh, it's this thing about mathematics I suppose isn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean I, 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 uh, <laughs> I'm interested in putting things into distance and uh, analyzing them and saying, uh, uh, this, okay, well, what's the structure? What's a new time structure? You know, which is, doesn't really relate to me. I suppose if I can, uh, that's more, you know, the, long, the longer the event is, the more it's something to me. But when you get down to this tiny scale, you get developed. Uh, so, but, but it's nice. 
having all these different levels, so if you can work in a very abstract, you know, this is a fascinating sound from a technical point of view, to Four people like that. George, you want to go to the extremity of the problem with Jeff? Can you try to do it? You said it was, well, I like what you said at the beginning of your talk, it was great. I mean, a lot of it's great, but it's really this chunk of fire, that was the huge memoir. Yeah. Thank you. 